Okay, picture this. In the not-too-distant future, you're heading out on a space vacation, and you need to decide which items are worth bringing along. But instead of checking the weather forecast, you open a gravity simulator. That's because you need to know how each object will behave on different planets. For instance, should you take this metal shovel with you or not? Well, according to your itinerary, it's going to be a long, long trip. You're planning to visit every planet in the solar system and even a few moons. But due to the difference in gravity on these space bodies, you're not sure how useful some of the objects you're going to bring along will be. Well, let's start with the basics. Tupperware. I don't know about other space travelers, but us Earthlings carry our Tupperware around everywhere we go. And still, if you were to transport it to, let's say, Mercury, it would most likely fly away into the atmosphere. These plastic containers you use to keep your food are too light. And since the gravity on Mercury is two and a half times weaker as gravity on Earth, well, maybe you'll have to fill your plastic containers up before taking them out of your spaceship to have a picnic. If a Tupperware container weighs about a half a pound on Earth, it'll weigh just a quarter of that on Mercury. Now, if we add some bananas, a handful of baby carrots, and two watermelons, then it'll be safe to carry it out of your space vehicle. You'll just have some difficulty making it all fit in in a standard size container. But wait! Before you do that, you should know that the atmospheric temperature on Mercury can reach up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit. This means that any plastic container will instantly melt as soon as it gets in contact with the air. It'll burn up all the food, too. You can probably try taking a titanium container, that will work, or just stick to astronaut food. Now, shall we say Venus? Okay, Venus. If you were to take the same empty container to Venus, it would behave similarly to how it does on Earth. This is because Venus is also known as our planet's twin. These two have much in common. For example, almost the same size and mass. And when the topic is gravity, the formula goes like this. The bigger the mass and the greater the density, the stronger the gravity. Venus's gravity is approximately 10% weaker than Earth's. So, yes, you may leave your spaceship with your container, empty or full, and enjoy a beautiful and scenic lunch on the surface of Venus. Now, you'll have to figure out a way to eat without taking your spacesuit off, though. The atmosphere of Venus is filled with sulfuric acid, which can irritate your nose and throat and cause difficulties in breathing. Or worse, much worse. Now, you'll have to forget about taking anything too light outside on Phobos. A little hint for you, it's not a Greek island. Not even Greek yogurt, although it's a cool name. It's actually one of Mars's moons. Here, even your spacecraft would need a little extra help to keep close to the ground. If it weighed as much as a school bus, any regular-sized person could pick it up with just one hand. This is because on Phobos, the inhabitants of Earth barely feel the weight of gravity. And be very careful when jumping around, because one leap and you may fly straight into outer space. Uh, passengers on board the Voyager spaceship, please keep your arms and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Well, you're approaching Jupiter, a gas giant. A never-ending storm is raging in its atmosphere. Plus, there's no solid surface there, which means no landing for you on this planet. If you look out the window, it might seem that you are moving through a giant cloud. But for the purpose of your experiment, it'll work just fine. Try throwing into the air that baseball you brought along in case you get bored of all the space travel. And measure the time it'll take the ball to hit the surface. If on Earth, the ball will fall at a speed of 32,174 feet per second. On Jupiter, the same ball will hit the ground at a speed 2.5 times greater than that. That's because Jupiter is more than 10 times as large as Earth, and around 300 times as heavy as our blue planet. Now, if you move your spaceship just a little bit to the side, to one of Jupiter's moons, Europa, the situation will be completely different. Throwing a baseball in the air on Europa will mean never seeing it again. Gravity there is almost non-existent, which means that not only a baseball, but even a grown-up person can fly away any second. Now, on the other hand, if you decided to venture out of the spacecraft to explore Europa's gravitational field, why not try to lift the space vehicle itself? On Europa, a regular Earthling can easily lift up to 1,000 pounds, which is the equivalent of a full-size male moose. 
Or you can lift a pyramid-like formation of nine regular people. Uh, The choice is yours. When approaching Saturn, be careful. While from afar, Saturn's rings look smooth and solid. From up close, you'll notice that they're made of chunks of ice and rocks floating in space. You won't want to have your spacecraft anywhere near those. There's also no solid surface on Saturn, which makes landing impossible. And the atmosphere is full of ammonia. Keep in mind that it's a pretty inhospitable environment for a human. Now inside the spaceship, you find a collection of sci-fi books, enough to fill an entire bookshelf. Altogether, they must weigh around 400 pounds. Yep, that many books. And like someone with a superpower, you try to lift over 200 pounds of weight at a time. But guess what? You fail! Because Saturn's gravity is too similar to that on Earth. Now in case you got confused with all this gravity talk, when we're measuring gravity, we're speaking about the power of the force by which a planet or other space body pulls objects toward its center. So if you need some help in organizing that sci-fi collection in alphabetical order, ask the crew to move the spaceship to a neighboring space body with a weaker gravitational pull, like uh, Pluto. These days, it's not considered a planet anymore, just a dwarf planet and one of the furthest from the sun's space bodies. You'll need an extra warm spacesuit to wear there. Pluto is freezing cold and has a tiny surface. It's smaller than Earth's moon. But it's a great place to test your strength. If on Earth it's kind of impossible for a regular person to lift an elephant, on Pluto, you'll be able to pick up a baby elephant weighing around 265 pounds or even a medium-sized elephant that can be as heavy as 2,000 pounds. On your way back to Earth, you make a pit stop on Uranus. The coldest planet in our solar system has an average temperature of around minus 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you attempt to get out of the spacecraft, you'll freeze mid-movement. Although gravity on Uranus is pretty similar to that on Earth, there's one thing that's very different – time. A two-week getaway on Earth turns into a three-year-long vacation on Uranus. Now, when you get sick of cold planets, you can travel back to warmer ones. Okay, now, Mars is definitely warmer than Uranus, but its average temperature is still about minus 81 degrees. On Earth, we only have such low temperatures at the South Pole during the winter. When you land on Mars, you'll start to feel light and strong at the same time. Mars's gravity is about 2.5 times weaker than that on Earth. So in other words, you'll probably manage to lift your own body weight without any difficulty. So all those handstands you've been dreaming of doing, you've found a place to fulfill your dream. You were lucky to find that 6 by 6 foot apartment after all. None of your friends own one. They mostly live in capsule modules where it's only possible to sleep without turning and tossing much. The price for what they call a mansion today is obscenely high, and you still fully can't accept it. Tomorrow, you gotta sign that contract and make the down payment. Actually, you had the chance to buy it only because you won that chance in the lottery. This is how you live in 2999, you and the other 100 billion people. Some people, though, invest in numerous new millennium apartment blocks on other planets. The latest real estate trend is to downshift somewhere on Ross 128b, Mars, or even Saturn. You were thinking about it too, but you just love the Earth's atmosphere and nature too much. While you're sipping your morning coffee, a pop-up advertisement hologram instantly fills all the space in your capsule, and it just won't disappear. Dear Earthen, don't miss out on the chance to change your life once and for all. Check out the newest apartment blocks on Ross 128B, Mars, Europa, and Saturn. Invest in your new housing and brand new life. Bus tours available daily. Suddenly, you realize this spam might be your chance. You still have some time before signing that contract. You've got nothing to lose, it's just a one-day tour. After all, 11 light years from Earth to Ross 128B aren't a big deal now. Just a couple of hours on that space bus the agency provides. You'll go there and see that there's no place like Earth, just to make sure you've made the right choice. You rush to the space bus station, and you're just in time. 3, 2, 1, go! The bus pulls out, and two hours later, you're already there on Ross 128B. Wow! It looks like a bit of old-fashioned Earth you've seen in scientific presentations at university. The surface is rocky with some green spots. These must be the forests and meadows scientists are trying to introduce. It does have an atmosphere, although artificial. 
The real estate agent says it's actually good. No unpredicted weather anymore. Everything is controlled by the dwellers. The only inconvenience is that the better the weather is, the heftier bill you're going to get next month. The UV protection is essential on Ross 128B. Its index is 38% higher than on Earth, so a regular sunscreen turns out pretty helpless. They say this planet is like the Earth twin, but you kind of disagree. There's some vegetation, but it all looks so weird, you feel like you're in a computer game. Next to the apartment block, there's an orchard and a small farm producing organic food for the locals. So you decide to pop in and check how it works. The fruits and vegetables look so odd there. You realize this must be an apple tree, but it has microchips instead of flower buds, and the fruit are cubicle. There are apples of all of the rainbow colors. You go forward and stumble on a small rock, one of the few things that belonged to this planet originally and weren't imported from Earth. A butterfly lands on the tip of your nose. You want to touch it, but as soon as your fingers reach it, the insect disperses in numerous pixels. The real estate agent runs up to you, helping you stand back on your feet. She says all the fauna on the planet is still represented in a form of holograms, because transferring it all from Earth doesn't seem possible at the moment. All the fauna elements are tightly connected together, and even the smallest butterfly can make a dramatic difference. With the money you have for the down payment on Earth, you can afford a two-story apartment on this planet. The only problem is tiring commuting to work every single day. Come on, y'all! Mars is ahead! We still have a lot of apartment blocks to show you! Ah, that's the real estate agent calling you. You hop on that bus and sometime later you land on Mars. By $29.99, it looks just spectacular, but a bit too sandy. The scientists still can't bring liquid water to this planet, even though the atmosphere is completely fine. The planet's too warm now because they tried to make it habitable. Even though there are glaciers, all the water instantly turns to gas because of the heat. You spot some large machines up in the sky. The real estate agent says these are some essential pieces of equipment that trap the gas water up in the sky to make Martian pouched water. She hands one pouch to you to try it out. Looks like an air balloon. Weird. You inhale it and… you've never tasted anything like this before. And you still can't understand how that gas quenched your thirst. The main plants on Mars are cacti of all forms. They adapted perfectly to its atmosphere and scientists even managed to blend other plant genes with those of cacti. These tall plants are a Martian type of maple. You can tell it looking at the leaves. Here, there are some pears growing on that large cactus. And you can see mangoes, avocados, and fruits of all kinds. They seem to be thriving. The sun's shining, and they're surrounded by water in the form of gas. It almost feels like home here. While Ross 128B still has to be developed, it's been over 200 years since the first ranch on Mars was made. The real estate is pricier here, though, so you can only afford a nice studio apartment. Looks like a bargain, but it's time to visit another planet. You're headed to Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. You've been to this planet last year on vacation, and you loved it a lot. 1,000 years ago, the scientists thought there was water under its icy crust, and they were right. The crust melted, forming a huge ocean twice the size of Earth's world ocean. And the planet itself has been undergoing various changes over the last millennium. All the cracks it had on its smooth surface formed many small continents. All of them were named after European countries, but you have enough time to visit only one of them, Italy. The continent is surrounded by azure water, and there are endless fragrant lemon trees. People cook pizza with freshly grown tomatoes, though they're as large as Earth's watermelons. One tomato is enough for two pizzas. You look through the Europa brochure to get more information about other continents. On Norway, there are mountains looking very much like Norwegian fjords. On France, there are endless lavender fields. And on the continent of Greece, there are large farms with olive trees. You close the brochure, realizing that real estate here is almost as pricey as back on Earth. No wonder too many people want to live there. Time's up! You've got one more planet ahead. The bus is about to land and there's an announcement. Welcome to Saturn! Put on your swimming masks and dive in to see our ultimate apartment block. The scientists spent over 250 years trying to solidify Saturn, but it was in vain. In the end, they decided to try making the first settlements back in the 2980s when you were a kid. The gravity on Saturn is a bit stronger than on Earth, which allowed scientists to construct large complexes under domes for people to dwell there. 
In the depths of Saturn's gas oceans, there's a wide variety of fauna. Jellyfish, octopuses, even sharks. They look a bit different, trying to adapt to their life on another planet. Their fins look way larger to help them handle incredibly strong winds of 1,100 miles an hour. But the most incredible part is the flora. Saturn's algae come in at at least 3,000 different colors. At least the brochure says so. You can also regulate their intensity and shade with a remote. Two hours later, you're back in your capsule. You keep tossing in your bed. It's the last night here. Tomorrow is the big day, but you're still in two minds. You saw that studio apartment on Mars in your dreams. You ate Martian pancakes topped with cactus maple syrup. The alarm goes off. Congratulations! You're now the owner of your own apartment on Earth. Very few people can make it in 2999, Mr. Sanders. You're holding a set of keys in your hand. A notification beeps on your phone. Lease your apartment on Earth and move to Mars. You won't ever have to work again. You can't help it and begin to smile. You fly away from Earth at a safe distance in your super modern spaceship, and then BAM! You travel faster than the speed of light in interstellar space. How cool! The light from thousands of stars rushes past you. A few minutes, and you're on the other side of the Milky Way and going to work. Such travel has long been common for humans. For you are a member of the human civilization that has conquered the entire galaxy. But it took almost 90 million years to get there. So how did we achieve this? It's like a computer game. In the beginning, we had a fleet of three motherships that could travel at 310 miles per second. Each of them had 10 colonization pads. The ship could undock a pad and drop it on the desired planet. We also had two speed ships that traveled twice as fast but could only colonize one planet. Each colonized planet could send one new ship on an expedition. So humanity was able to spread across the galaxy in 90 million years. Most of that time was spent flying from star to star. So the main problem of colonization is speed. Year 2021. Our spaceships can now fly at about 24,850 miles per hour. That's enough speed to travel from New York to Los Angeles in less than 4 minutes. But a trip to neighboring planets like Mars still takes about 7 months. The nearest star to the Sun, Proxima Centauri, is 4.2 light years away. That means light, the fastest thing in the universe, takes 4.2 years to get there from the Sun. It would take our rocket 73,000 years to get there. That's longer than an advanced human civilization has existed. And our galaxy, the Milky Way, is 105,000 light years wide. So even traveling at the speed of light would take forever. So naturally, humanity came up with other ways to travel. Let's move into the future and imagine that we've solved this problem. We started accelerating with microscopic probes propelled by a directional laser beam from Earth. This made it possible to reach speeds of 25% of the speed of light, still very slow. The problem was that nothing that has mass can travel at the speed of light. So we moved on to the Alcubierre drive study. This method doesn't involve moving from point A to point B, but instead compressing the space between those points. Here's a piece of checkered paper. Imagine that you need to travel three squares to your destination. Instead of moving in a straight line as fast as possible, we squeeze these squares so that our spaceship is at point B. Now we unsqueeze them back. Space is normalized and we've traveled, in fact, standing still. This is how the Alcubierre drive works. It compresses space in front of the spaceship and expands it behind its tail. So, theoretically, an Alcubierre drive spaceship can move at any speed, even faster than the speed of light. But the amount of energy needed to do this is enormous, and it could be compared to the mass energy of the entire planet of Jupiter. So, while some scientists were working to improve the Alcubierre drive, others were looking inside the most mysterious object in the universe, a black hole. A black hole is something so heavy that it attracts even light and won't let it go. Imagine a circular trampoline. This is our space-time. We put a basketball in its center. The trampoline sags a little bit. Now all the objects we put on the trampoline will roll toward the basketball. That's how gravity works. But if you roll the golf ball past the basketball, it has a chance of getting out of this funnel. Now put a heavy bowling ball in the center of the trampoline. The trampoline sags even more. Now the golf ball will inevitably fall into the funnel with the bowling ball with no chance of escape. That's how a black hole works. And some scientists believe there may be a wormhole at the heart of a black hole. It's a shortcut between point A and point B in the universe. 
back to our piece of paper. Instead of moving straight ahead, we fold the piece so that point A is right above point B. Now we make a hole in the paper and move to point B. We unfold it back and voila, you've arrived at your destination. So there's a theory that if a spaceship enters the black hole's gravitational field and withstands the incredible stress there, it can exit to any other point in the universe which that wormhole led to. It might even be another galaxy, or even a parallel universe. Well, our research was successful, and now, looking at a map of the Milky Way, we can get to absolutely anywhere. All that remains is to choose the right place to colonize. There are about a billion stars. Around each of them are planets possibly suitable for life. So we need to narrow down the list. First, we look for relatively young stars, almost like our sun. Near them, a human colony can potentially live for a long time. After that, when a star gets old, it begins to expand and turn red. In the last stages of its life, it can absorb all the planets around it and then explode with such force that the light from the explosion can be seen dozens of light years away. Secondly, the candidate for a human colony must be in the habitable zone of the star. It's a sweet spot, not too far away from and not too close to the star, so that it's not too cold or too hot there. In other words, water on the planet must exist in liquid form. Also, the candidate planet must have a solid surface, so that we can live on it. Another important factor is the size of the planet. If it's too big, its gravitational force will press on us. It'll be harder for us to jump, walk, and lift weights on this planet because we're used to the Earth's gravity. But if the planet is too small, we'll feel like real strongmen there. We'll be able to jump high and lift large weights. But then our muscles will lose tone and our health will deteriorate. So we're looking for a planet about the size of Earth. Altogether, we have about 100,000 star systems that fit our parameters, so we start exploring and colonizing. And here's our first target. We've named this planet New Home. Mmm, clever. We fire up our faster-than-light engine, and bam, we're there! Even though this planet fits all our criteria, it's still hard to call this place home. Desert landscapes with lots of craters and canyons. We'll have to work hard to make this place look like Earth. The terraforming phase of the planet is about to begin. That means we're going to change the climate and the atmosphere here. We need about 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen so we can breathe here without spacesuits. So we're launching air plants. Other plants will produce water. We're also building power plants and a plant to produce fuel for our spacecraft. Last but not least, food extraction. Once everything is ready, the colony here can exist on its own. And after several centuries, this planet will be developed and populated enough to send an expedition to colonize neighboring worlds. So for many millions of years, humanity has been weaving its web in the Milky Way. From one planet to another, we've colonized our galaxy. Humanity is now not only multiplanetary, but also interstellar. The next goal is to make us an intergalactic species. Here's our Milky Way. Zoom out. This is the local group of galaxies. Each one contains millions of stars, candidates for colonization. We have to travel 5 million light years to get there. Zoom out again. Virgo Supercluster. There are about 100 clusters of galaxies similar to our own. Zoom out again. Billion light years from our home. Neighboring superclusters. Now each galaxy looks like a little dot, and there are thousands and millions of them. Zoom out even more. 14 billion light years from Earth. This is our observable universe. There are about 2 trillion galaxies. Even at a thousand times the speed of light, it would take us billions of years to colonize even 1% of the stars here. But it's not over yet. There's a cold spot on the map of the observable universe. Some scientists think it's a scar from a collision of our universe with a neighboring one. They say the universes could be like bubbles, each containing trillions of galaxies. Once such bubble crashed into ours, and its gravitational force ripped clusters of galaxies out of our universe. If this is true, then parallel universes do exist. Then we have truly endless possibilities for exploration, finding new worlds for humanity, and contact with extraterrestrial civilizations. Hmm, sounds like fun. This may look like a scene from a cool sci-fi movie, or an astonishing painting, but it's actually real-life footage of Mars the very planet known for its bright rust color. Layers of rock and dust cover the planet's surface. They consist of iron-rich minerals. That's why dust on Mars is mostly iron oxide. 
It floats in the atmosphere and creates an orange-red haze around the planet. But Mars has some even more amazing things, like these blue speckles on its surface. They look like a wind-sculpted sea of dunes around 19 miles wide. Astronauts saw these dunes at the northern polar cap of the planet. That's a region that covers an area approximately as big as Texas. The blue dunes, formed by winds, are shaped like long, weaving lines. The winds on Mars are relentless and strong. They turn the barren surface of the planet into terrains of grand beauty. These winds are influenced by many different factors. For example, temperature fluctuations to the way the planet's atmosphere circulates. The atmosphere is thin on Mars. That's the reason liquid water most likely can't exist there for any long period of time. That's why, even though Mars is only half the diameter of our planet, it has the same amount of dry land as Earth. A thin atmosphere is also the reason why wind needs to be exceptionally strong and fast to move the sand and form such shapes as these dunes. Winds usually move at 10 to 20 miles per hour on Mars. Anyway, even though the image looks pretty colorful, the dunes aren't actually blue. The bluish patches represent colder parts, while the warmer regions are yellowish-orange. The images were part of a set of photos released to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Odyssey, a spacecraft orbiting Mars. Mars has numerous sand dunes in different locations all over its surface. Some of them formed a billion years ago, like the ones in the Valles Marineris region. They haven't changed because both the atmospheric pressure and wind patterns there have remained the same. But some things do change. For example, some dunes get covered with frost. Here, the main dune has a series of dark patterns. It may be because frost comes and goes, depending on the season. Mars has four seasons, just like Earth, but they're twice as long as ours. It's because Mars needs around two Earth years to orbit the sun. Seasons are harsher in the south of the planet than in the north. During southern winter, the planet is farthest away from the sun. Mars moves pretty slowly, and its orbit is elliptical, different from the orbit of Earth, which is almost circular. Spring on Mars is a season with plenty of dust storms that start in one part of the planet and, eventually, turn into huge storms. They become so large, they blanket the entire planet. Each planet of our solar system has something that makes it special. Jupiter, for example, is not only the largest planet, more than twice as big as all other planets combined, but it also has the biggest ocean in the solar system. Jupiter is made of similar elements to the Sun. They're mostly helium and hydrogen. In the deeper parts of the planet's atmosphere, temperature and pressure increase. That's why the hydrogen gas gets compressed and turns into liquid. That gives Jupiter the biggest ocean, but it's made of hydrogen, not water. There's also a theory that somewhere halfway to Jupiter's center, the pressure increases so much that electrons start getting squeezed out of hydrogen atoms. This allows the liquid to conduct electricity as effectively as most metals do. Jupiter is rotating fast, which creates electrical currents and generates a strong magnetic field. But as a gas giant, the planet doesn't have a firm surface. The planet's swirls and stripes are cold, windy clouds of water and ammonia. Jupiter also has the iconic Great Red Spot, which is an insanely large storm with crimson-colored clouds spinning counterclockwise. Winds there are way faster than any hurricane on our planet. The Great Red Spot has slightly changed throughout time and is currently bigger than our planet. It's 1.3 times as wide as Earth. Scientists have discovered that its roots extend more than 200 miles into Jupiter's atmosphere. A regular tropical cyclone we see on our planet can only extend 9 miles from the top to the bottom of the storm. These days, the red spot is becoming smaller and taller at the same time. Jupiter also has dozens of moons and a couple of rings. But unlike Saturn's rings, these are quite faint and mostly made of dust, not ice. Also, there's a salty ocean under the surface of Jupiter's biggest moon, Ganymede. It's hidden below a thick icy crust. It's likely to contain more water than all surface water reservoirs we have on Earth combined. The theory says this ocean is around 60 miles deep, 10 times greater than the deepest point of our planet's oceans. Jupiter and Saturn contain 10 million tons of precious stones. The pressure inside these planets' atmospheres can actually turn carbon into small pieces of diamonds. If you put these diamonds under extreme temperatures and pressure, they can melt. This would probably result in some sort of diamond rain. In the beginning, our solar system was just a swirling cloud of gas and dust. 
It eventually developed into a spinning disk with the central star in the middle. Almost all planets in our solar system move counterclockwise around the sun. Venus is the only planet that rotates in a clockwise direction, and Uranus rotates on its side. These planets are most likely different because long ago, huge asteroids collided with them and kinda knocked them off their course. There's a chance Venus could be a habitable planet. It's definitely not a place you'd want to live now, not with its sulfuric acid clouds and tremendous atmospheric pressure. It's 90 times greater than that on Earth. At here, insanely high temperatures, the conditions on Venus are very unfavorable for people. At 863 degrees Fahrenheit, Venus is hotter than Mercury, even though it's further away from the Sun. This happens because there's too much carbon dioxide in Venus's atmosphere. It traps heat, which causes the temperature to rise way higher than it's supposed to. But simulations show that around 700 million years ago, Venus might have been a nice place with moderate temperatures and liquid water. Those conditions were slightly similar to those we have on Earth now. Uranus is not a gas giant. It's actually made of ice. The atmosphere contains methane, which makes the planet look blue. It has 27 moons, two sets of rings, and lots of ice in its atmosphere. A day on Uranus lasts just a little bit over 17 hours. That's how long it takes the planet to complete a single rotation on its axis. But its tilt is so pronounced that most of the time, either one or the other pole is pointed toward the sun. That's why the daytime length at the North Pole is almost half a year, and a year on Uranus is as long as 84 years. If you lived on Uranus closer to its North Pole, you'd be able to see the sun in the sky for 42 years. That would be the summer. After this, the sun would go down, and you'd have to live the next 42 years in the darkness. It'd be the winter on the planet. Neptune is the most distant and the smallest of the gas giants. The gravity on the planet is similar to the one we have on Earth, but you wouldn't be able to stand on Neptune's surface. It's gas, not solid land. Triton, the biggest of the planet's moons, orbits Neptune in a very unusual way. It moves backward compared to the rest of the planet's moons. Triton is also slowly spiraling inward toward Neptune. One day, billions of years from now, it's likely to get torn apart by the planet's gravitational forces and become just a ring around Neptune. This ring will continue being pulled inward until it eventually crashes into the planet. Pluto is a dwarf planet, and a year there lasts 248 Earth years. But even though it's not even a planet, Pluto still has several interesting things to offer, like floating mountains. Pluto's nitrogen glaciers carry countless isolated hills, each up to several miles across. They're likely to be fragments of water ice from the dwarf planet's surrounding uplands. Nitrogen ice is denser than water ice, so scientists think water ice hills float in a sea of frozen nitrogen, just like icebergs in the Arctic Ocean here on Earth. I hope you feel well rested, because I've got a tough task for you. Don't worry, it's fun. You're going to visit different planets of our solar system and try to run on each of them. Let's figure out where you can run the fastest and where you can barely walk. The fastest man on Earth, Usain Bolt, can run with an average speed of about 23 miles per hour. But his top speed is higher, up to 27 miles per hour. Sadly, we can't all be Usain Bolt's. The average person runs at a speed of 6 to 8 miles per hour. But maybe there's a planet out there where you can beat the famous Jamaican sprinter's records. But first things first, what will affect your speed when you run on other planets? For one thing, gravity. Depending on how strong it is on the planet you visit, it'll influence your weight. And in most cases, the heavier you are, the more slowly you run. Plus, on all other planets in our solar system except Earth, you'll have to wear a bulky spacesuit. Without it, your chances of survival there are non-existent. And don't forget about extreme weather conditions on most planets. It's either freezing cold or boiling hot, or very, and I mean it, windy. Anyway, your amazing journey is about to begin. Buckle your seatbelt. The first planet on your itinerary is Mercury. As you sneak a peek at this world through the window of your spaceship, you notice that the planet looks eerily similar to the good old moon. But just a few moments later, you realize it's just an illusion. All over the surface of Mercury, you see craters left by space rocks. Hmm, this may make your task of running on this planet way harder. This and your bulky spacesuit. Duh. 
But you wouldn't survive on Mercury without this protection. The temperatures on the planet are extreme. 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit at night. Hey. But there's one thing that can work in your favor on this unfriendly planet. Let's say you weigh 155 pounds on Earth. Then on Mercury, you'd weigh around 58 pounds. Which means that despite your bulky spacesuit, you can move way faster than you do on Earth. And maybe your speed will even reach 13 miles per hour if you try really hard. The next planet on your itinerary is Venus also called the Morning Star. While coming closer, you see a world very different from the bluish planet you might have seen in books. Before landing, you have to get through a super dense atmosphere made up of carbon dioxide. And while your spacecraft is descending, you're watching thick clouds of sulfuric acid pass by. Venus is often called Earth's twin because these two planets are of similar size and density. No wonder that on Venus, you weigh almost as much as you do on Earth. 140 pounds. So your weight is a bit smaller here, but don't forget about your spacesuit. And still, because of almost the same conditions on the two planets, you'd be able to run a bit faster than on Earth at around 8.5 miles per hour. Your first impression of Mars is that it's freezing cold. The average temperature here is about negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Even from afar, the planet looks reddish. Once you make your first step on the Martian surface, you understand why. The ground's covered with rusty colored dust. The same fine dust is floating in the air around you. Wherever you look, you see golden, brown, tan, and even greenish hues. They depend on the minerals that make up the soil. The size of the dust layer varies from area to area, but in most places, it's around seven feet thick. Hmm, that can make running much more difficult. On Mars, your weight would be much smaller than on Earth, a mere 58 pounds. This will help you achieve an impressive speed of 12 miles per hour. <laughs> Aren't you a champ? What's that on the horizon? It looks like a tornado. Is it a dust storm? Then it's time to make a run for it. Dust storms sometimes cover the entire planet, and you can even see the largest ones from Earth. And now you're facing a problem. You see, Jupiter, as well as Saturn, is a gas giant. This means that the largest planet in the solar system, and Jupiter is so large it could swallow 1,300 Earths, doesn't have any solid surface. Well, you'll just have to imagine what your running workout would look like if you could run on Jupiter. This planet has an atmosphere that consists of hydrogen and helium gas. During your descent, you admire thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds. They make the planet look colorful and beautifully striped. On Jupiter, you'd weigh 390 pounds. You'd have to break a sweat to simply walk there wearing your clumsy spacesuit. If you could step on the planet's surface, that is. If you tried to run there, your best result would probably be a speed of one or two miles per hour. To make matters worse, it's extremely windy on Jupiter, with the wind speeds ranging from 200 to 400 miles per hour. Do you see those rings? That's Saturn, another gas giant with no solid surface. This planet's made up of mostly hydrogen and helium, and its temperature and density change the deeper you go. If you decided to leave your spacecraft and step on Saturn's surface, you'd just fall into the planet. But from above, it looks as if Saturn does have a surface. The seemingly solid yellowish-brown sphere is surrounded by several layers of clouds. The visible outer layer is made up of ammonia clouds. Under them, there are hydrosulfide clouds. And the innermost layer is made up of clouds of water. Even though Saturn is a gas giant, your weight wouldn't be very different here, around 165 pounds. That's because the planet's gravity is similar to that of Earth. But because of the conditions on the planet, and your bulky, bulky spacesuit, you'd run a bit more slowly there at a speed of about four miles per hour. Before leaving, you admire Saturn's most famous feature, awesome gray, beige, and tan rings. These groups of tiny ringlets are made of chunks of rock and ice. You also spot several of the 53 moons of Saturn. Oh, that's Titan, an icy world bigger than our moon and even Mercury. It's the second largest moon in the solar system.
The next planet on your way is a blue-green ball of ice and gas. That's ice giant Uranus. It has this beautiful hue because the light from the sun gets reflected off the planet's surface. Uranus isn't solid. Hit the brakes! If your spacecraft doesn't manage to stop in time, it'll fly through the upper atmosphere and sink into the icy liquid center of the planet. Hmm, I doubt you'll be able to conduct your running experiment here. So, let's just imagine what it'd look like. On Uranus, your weight would be around 138 pounds. And, against all odds, you could actually reach a good speed here, at least 8 miles per hour. If you didn't get caught in a hurricane, of course. Extreme storms occur on the planet in the summer, when Uranus is heated the most. Then, hurricanes can spread for more than 6,000 miles. The furthest planet from the Sun, Neptune, is four times the size of Earth, but 17 times as heavy. The blue surface you see when approaching Neptune is actually a layer of swirling gas and permanent clouds. The planet's mantle is made up of water, ammonia, and methane ices. It's the closest thing Neptune has to a surface. And still, there isn't solid ground for you to walk on. So, once again, try to use your imagination. On Neptune, you'd weigh a bit more than you do on Earth, 174 pounds. But your running speed would be just a bit lower than on Earth, around 5 miles per hour. That's the end of your active adventure! Which planet did you like running on the most? Check out that buff dude over there with the orange skin. He's been chilling on Mars for a hot minute, which is why he looks like he used the wrong shade of self-tan. You see, all those carotenoids and carrots, sweet potatoes, bell peppers, tomatoes, and pumpkins are protecting him from those UV rays. The more he eats, the more orange he gets. And as for his sturdiness, it's all about that Martian gravity. The gravity here makes us perceive our weight differently. And if you want to be a boss on Mars, you gotta eat heavily. Like, if a person weighs 150 pounds on Earth, it feels like no more than 55 pounds on Mars. So, overeating can help shorten that gravity to weight gap. Mercury is a whole different thing. It's hotter than Georgia asphalt during the day, but colder than Elsa's castle at night. You gotta be made of metal with a high melting point to be able to survive here. But for us regular humans, we'd be toast. Literally. Even though Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, Venus is still the hottest one. Life on Venus, more like life on the sun's evil twin. The temperature here typically hovers around 870 degrees Fahrenheit on average. Surviving at the boiling point of water or in the extreme heat of Venus is a challenge for most earthly species. Only a select few can endure boiling hot temperatures. Others rush to Starbucks to grab an iced latte with the first beams of the spring sun. So no human being can really evolve enough to survive on Venus. The only creatures that could thrive there are probably tardigrades and those weirdos who put hot sauce on everything. You wonder what tardigrades are? Well, those are minuscule and adorable caterpillar-like creatures that possess remarkable durability. They can endure boiling water, the depths of a sea trench, and the frigid, lightless void of space. Recently, tardigrades were included in a scientific study aboard a spacecraft that unfortunately crashed on the moon. Scientists speculate that the tardigrades may have survived the impact. Hey. Would you like to turn into this creature and live on Venus? We're done with terrestrial planets. Let's move on to gas giants. Now look at this dude from Saturn. He's got flippers and not arms. He's got small holes with no external ear flaps instead of regular ears. Most of this gas giant is colder than your ex's heart, as the temperature is about minus 220F. You can't walk on it, but you can turn into a snowball or an ice crystal if you're feeling frisky. Things are quite similar on Jupiter, so probably turning into a seal and chilling there is not that bad of an idea. At least you can live there rent-free. And don't even get me started on Neptune and Uranus. These guys are ice giants with no solid surface, so those sharp-clawed dudes you see in movies? Yeah, they don't exist. Plus, these two ain't exactly hospitable to life. I'll stick to my sweet potatoes on Mars. Thank you very much. One point five feet with the Earth's gravity. Verification complete. Now the simulation room will recreate Mercury. Ah, uh, it, it's so hot in here. Yes, it's like standing next to a volcano. Your jump is four feet high. Now switch to Venus. 
Wow, this place looks scary. On the real Venus, everything is toxic. I feel no difference. Yes, the gravity here is almost the same as on Earth. Switch to the moon. Gravity on the moon is 10 times lighter than Earth's, 9 feet. The next one is Mars. Huh? It's pretty comfortable here. The gravity here is the same as on Mercury. 4 feet. Now, prepare for the struggle. Huh? What do you... There is no solid surface on Jupiter. Although Jupiter is a great deal larger in size, its surface gravity is just 2.4 times that of the surface gravity of Earth. Ugh, it's hard to even stand here. Only half a foot. Got it. Switch to Saturn. There is no solid surface here either, but Saturn's gravity is almost the same as Earth's. Now Uranus. It's five times warmer here than on the real Uranus. Seriously? Ah, my legs 1. are... 1.7 feet. Gravity is slightly weaker than Earth's. That's Neptune for you. Your jumps are 1.3 feet high. Gravity is slightly stronger than Earth's. Get me out of he he here. Ah! Jeez, no need to swing your fists here. These savages can't even eat in mm. peace. Don't 
is the Earth's closest space neighbor and its only natural satellite. It likely formed when a huge Mars-sized object crashed into our planet billions of years ago. I wasn't around then. This catastrophe turned Earth into a scorching ball of molten rock. It also pushed some material into its orbit, creating the Moon. Now, this heavily cratered sphere moves around our planet. This causes high and low tides around the globe. A bit more than one-fourth the size of Earth, it's the fifth largest natural satellite in the solar system. The Moon has several phases. For example, new, full, or crescent Moon, first and last quarter. But whatever the satellite looks like, you can always find it in the night sky, and sometimes even during the day. But imagine waking up at night and noticing that the Moon looks somewhat different than usual. It seems brighter and bigger. It's hardly noticeable, especially when you're half asleep. You go back to bed, unaware that instead of the moon, you've just seen Mercury. Close up, this planet, the nearest to the sun, is similar to our natural satellite. Its surface is littered with craters left by space rocks. Mercury is about two-fifths the size of our planet, but it's still a bit larger than the moon. That's why the planet would have a greater influence on Earth. Nights would become brighter. High tides would become higher, and low tides, mm, what do you think, lower? Yup. The lunar cycle, that's the time the Moon, or rather Mercury now, needs to go through all the phases, would become 14 hours shorter. But all in all, such a replacement wouldn't have any drastic consequences for our planet. But then, how about Venus? What if, instead of the familiar satellite, we swap in the third brightest natural object after the Sun and the Moon? It's often called Earth's sister planet because their mass and size are nearly the same. Venus would be as large in our sky as Earth once appeared to the Apollo astronauts when they looked at it from the moon's surface. The morning star would be much brighter than the moon. For one thing, the planet reflects six times more sunlight. Plus, it would occupy an area at least 16 times larger. That's why nights on Earth would be as bright as early twilight now. If you looked at Venus, you'd spot vague, swirling patterns in the planet's yellowish-white cloud cover. Venus wouldn't become Earth's satellite. The two planets would likely orbit around their common center of mass, and this orbit would be quite eccentric, like me. But if Venus moved with the same speed as the Moon has now, the two planets would crash into each other in the nearest future. Uh Uh-oh. Okay, let's pull another switcheroo. If Mars was up there in the sky instead of the Moon, you'd surely notice it. Even without a telescope, you'd be able to marvel at its unusual color and dark spots on its surface. And even if you didn't see the red planet, you'd still feel something unusual. Mars is half of Earth's size, but several times larger than the Moon. Replacing a smaller space body with a much bigger one would upset the delicate balance on our planet. If you were unlucky to be at the seaside when Mars took the Moon's place, you'd have to evacuate as soon as possible. Massive waves would rise in the oceans under Martian influence. They would crash against the shoreline like the largest tsunamis. Mars would be reflecting more sunlight than the Moon. Nights would be lighter. Terrestrial landscapes would have an eerie red tint. And you'd be able to admire the tallest mountain in the solar system, Olympus Mons, through a telescope. Mars isn't large enough to change the Earth's orbit dramatically. But with time, the two planets would probably begin to orbit each other, creating a binary planet system. And since Mars would literally be next door, voyages to this planet would become a reality. Okay now, think really big. If Jupiter replaced the Moon, Earth, as an independent planet, wouldn't exist anymore. It would instantly turn into another moon of the largest planet in the solar system. The only positive moment in this transformation? People would have an awesome sky view. 
Jupiter is dozens of times larger than the Moon, a gigantic, beautifully striped sphere would cover nearly all the horizon. If you had time to enjoy the show, you'd see yellow, brown, red, and white clouds floating in Jupiter's atmosphere. Sadly, the gas giant's gravitational pull would instantly cause severe earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and tsunamis. Earth's mantle and crust would be drawn toward Jupiter, which would break the planet apart. It'd be stretched and compressed with such force that its surface would bulge back and forth by more than 300 feet. Unfortunately, Earth's speed is only 10% of the speed needed for us to stay in Jupiter's orbit. That's why our sluggish planet would crash into the gas giant in less than a day. Well, that sounds unpleasant, so let's not do that. Now, if Saturn were to replace the Moon, it would be a sight to behold. The planet is more than 35 times larger than our satellite. It means the giant golden globe would cover 18 degrees of the sky, and its rings would stretch even further from horizon to horizon. Hey, if you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. Earth would be a bit further away from the gas giant than its own moon, Dion. And since Saturn is way more powerful than our planet, Earth would turn into its satellite, not the other way around. Unfortunately, Earth's rotational speed wouldn't be enough to keep up, and we'd most likely crash into the much larger planet within a day or two. But before burning up in Saturn's atmosphere, we'd have to pass through its magnificent rings. They're made up of pieces of comets, asteroids, and shattered moons. It wouldn't be an easy feat to get through this space debris. Plus, our planet would have to avoid Saturn's moons, all 53 of them. But what if the fall didn't happen, and Earth did turn into Saturn's 54th moon? Then the gas giant's gravitational pull would lead to massive tectonic shifts all over our globe. They would be tearing the planet's crust apart until there's nothing left. Hmm, not good either. Both Uranus and Neptune are ice giants. These planets are the same size, larger than Earth, but smaller than Saturn and Jupiter. They both have icy interiors, deep atmospheres, and similar color very beautiful bluish-green. If either of these planets replaced the Moon, the consequences would be the same. So, let's flip a coin. Okay, it would be Neptune you'd see in the sky one day. Neptune is 14 times larger than the Moon. The planet would look like a bright blue hot air balloon in the sky, not only at night but during the day, too. It would appear to be 15 times larger than the Sun. If everything else remained the same, a solar eclipse would seem to continue for ages. Once the Sun vanished behind Neptune's edge, our planet would be plunged into complete darkness for no less than an hour and a half. Neptune is 17 times the mass of Earth, and its gravitational pull is much stronger. That's why our planet would end up as a satellite, yep, again. It would orbit Neptune slightly further than its own largest moon, Triton. By the way, there would be a great risk of Earth colliding with this space body. But let's assume we were lucky enough not to cross paths with Neptune satellites. Even so, there would be more than enough problems on our hands. Tides on our planet would become a thousand times more powerful than those caused by the Moon. Neptune's gravitational force wouldn't pull Earth apart, but it would heat our planet up. The seismic activity would increase, setting off earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. And probably louse up the internet, too. Get your closet ready. We're moving to Mercury. Your mission is to find out what you need to wear there to feel comfortable. So, Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun in our solar system. It's pretty hot here, about 800 degrees Fahrenheit, twice as much as your kitchen oven can produce. You need a heat reflective suit like this. It looks like foil for duck roasting. The shiny, almost mirror-like surface reflects the heat rays and keeps everything inside from getting baked. That's you. This suit is designed to get to the hearts of volcanoes on Earth and can withstand up to 1,470 degrees Fahrenheit. That's twice as much as at the equator of Mercury. Oh, and bring an oxygen tank. Otherwise, you won't be able to breathe there. And you need to strap some heavy dumbbells to your legs. Mercury is smaller than Earth, and gravity is almost three times weaker here. So you have to increase your weight almost three times to feel comfortable. It gets extremely cold there at night, so you need to stuff your thermal suit with insulation. But even that won't save you from the cold. It's three times colder than at the North Pole. Plus, Mercury's atmosphere doesn't protect you from solar radiation as well as Earth's. 
So, you need to wear thick lead plates under your suit for protection. But the best thing to do is just evacuate from this planet. The next one is Venus. Although it's called Earth's twin sister, the scenery here looks frightening. A hot desert with volcanoes and clouds so dense that you can barely see the sun. These clouds contribute to the greenhouse effect. So, Venus is the hottest planet in the solar system, 890 degrees Fahrenheit. But the usual heat reflective suit won't help you this time. The atmospheric pressure here is 92 times higher than on the surface of the Earth. That's like diving 3,200 feet underwater. So the air on Venus will just crush you. To survive, you need an airtight suit made of titanium or other sturdy materials. On Earth, we use an atmospheric diving suit like this to withstand the intense pressure underwater. It's like a mini submarine in the shape of a human body. And it's already equipped with an oxygen tank. Yes, the air on Venus is not only unbreathable, it's also toxic. The next planet is Earth. Just look out the window and decide for yourself what to wear today, okay? Let's go to Earth's satellite, the Moon. A few people have been here already, and they were wearing pretty big spacesuits. The main thing is to bring an oxygen tank. It's contained in a backpack along with the life support system. Even though it's cold, there's no atmosphere. It's almost a vacuum, and there's no air particles to take heat from your body, so you won't freeze instantly. Your suit itself should be airtight and keep the atmospheric pressure inside. The lower the pressure, the lower the temperature the fluid can boil over. In space, fluids from your body can evaporate in seconds. You don't want that, so you should wear a spacesuit. It'll also save you from dangerous solar radiation. The moon is defenseless against it. And the gravity here is six times weaker than on Earth. So you can jump six times higher and lift six times more weight. It makes sense to take a little weight with you, so you don't feel as clumsy as the first astronauts. Next up, Mars. In summer, you could walk around here in shorts and a t-shirt. The highest recorded temperature here is about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. In colder times, you'd have to wear a sweater and a warm jacket here, maybe even two. The average temperature here is slightly colder than the coldest point on Earth. But the atmospheric pressure here is frustrating. It's 170 times less than we're used to. Take the altitude at which commercial airplanes fly on Earth. Multiply it by three. The conditions there are very similar to those on Mars. It's cold and there's no oxygen to breathe. Without a spacesuit, you'd last two minutes at most on Mars. So you need an airtight spacesuit on you all the time on the surface of Mars. NASA scientists are preparing a new generation of spacesuits that will allow astronauts to climb, crawl, and bend without difficulty. You'd feel like a real athlete on the surface of Mars. The gravity there is three times weaker than on Earth, so you could easily lift an animal the size of a tiger there. Don't forget to put a spacesuit on it, of course. Now, let's fly through the asteroid belt further into space and arrive at Jupiter. It's the largest planet in our solar system, and it's a gas giant. That means there's no solid surface, so you can't even stand there. Although, hypothetically, you could jump into Jupiter. Then you'd keep falling all the way to the planet's core. Suppose you're standing on a platform just above the surface of the planet. The first thing you feel is the force of gravity. It's 2.5 times stronger here. You feel it pulling you down, and you can barely even jump up. So it would be nice to equip your spacesuit with an exoskeleton to support your body and help you move. Plus, it's incredibly cold. You'll feel the cold at about negative 229 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface of the clouds of the gas giant. And what makes things worse is the constant wind. It can reach speeds of up to 900 miles per hour, almost twice as fast as the speed of commercial airplanes on Earth. That kind of cold wind will instantly draw heat away from your body, so your spacesuit must be really thick and warm. But the pressure at the top of these clouds is almost the same as on Earth. Technically, you could even take off your helmet here if it weren't for the lack of oxygen and severe cold. Maybe Saturn promises better conditions. Another gas giant. The gravitational force here is almost the same as on Earth, so nothing will constrain your movements except for a massive spacesuit. 
It's even colder here than on Jupiter, and the pressure here is about the same as about 15 feet underwater on Earth. So, the spacesuit not only lets you breathe and stay warm, but keeps your eardrums intact. Hey, hold on tight! You just almost got blown away by a gust of wind over 1,100 miles per hour. That's not unusual on Saturn. That kind of wind on Earth could get you from one coast of the United States to another in just two and a half hours. The only option to warm up here is to jump down to the center of the planet. The closer you get to the core, the warmer it gets. But the pressure rises at a tremendous rate. In just a few seconds of freefall, even the toughest titanium suit will be crushed. Let's finally step onto a solid surface, Titan, Saturn's moon. It's 1.5 times the size of our moon and 80% heavier. And its surface is mostly composed of water, ice, and rock. The pressure here is a little bit higher than on Earth. You wouldn't feel any discomfort if it weren't extremely cold. Titan is 9.5 times further from the Sun than Earth, so our star can barely warm this moon. The air here is mostly nitrogen, just like on Earth. But oxygen is completely absent here, so it's impossible to breathe without a spacesuit. There may be a huge ocean beneath Titan's surface. Saturn's gravity heats up this moon's core enough to make the ice melt. Plus, it must be extremely salty, which means it can remain liquid even at very low temperatures. The next two planets are Uranus and Neptune. So Uranus holds the record for the coldest planet in our solar system. The temperature here is about negative 224 degrees Celsius, so bring the warmest spacesuit you have. They say if you jump to the center of Uranus, at one point the pressure becomes so high that it turns hydrogen into a crust of ice. And if you get even lower, you can see the rocky core. Neptune, in turn, holds the record for the strongest winds in the solar system. It's an ice giant, just like Uranus. So the dress code here is the usual. A super warm spacesuit, a tank of oxygen, and a heating system. So far, we don't have the kind of spacesuit that would help you survive on any of the gas giants. But if you get to the core of Neptune, it gets too hot. Its temperature is almost the same as on the surface of the sun. Hey, listen up. Do you want to lose weight fast or gain more mass in just a few seconds? Forget all about diets and sports. We have an out-of-this-world way to do it. Space travel. And now I'm taking you to the heart of our solar system, to the sun. Hold on and bring your shades. There's no solid surface here, just hot liquid plasma. So take your heat reflective suit and stay on the platform just above the boiling surface of the star. On Earth, you weigh 135 pounds. But here, on the Sun, your weight is about 3,600 pounds. That's like a small sedan or a hippo. Hey, just saying. It has to do with gravity. The bigger and denser a space object is, the stronger its gravitational pull and the heavier your body feels. The Sun is 99% of the mass of the entire solar system. But although the star is 333,000 times as heavy as Earth, it's also much bigger. That's why gravity is only 27 times stronger on its surface. You can't stand up straight here. You get pulled down by gravity. And if on Earth, you could lift 135 pounds of your own weight, here you can only lift a small pumpkin. Happy Halloween! Moving on, Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun. It's very hot, about twice as hot as the maximum temperature in your kitchen oven. You jump down onto the rocky surface of Mercury and step on the scales. They show only 51 pounds compared to your real weight of 135 pounds. Mercury is almost 17 times smaller than Earth, but its core and crust are very dense. So the gravity here is only 2.5 times weaker than that on our home planet. It means you can jump 2.5 times higher here, and you feel much stronger. You can lift a big gorilla, but don't forget to make it wear a spacesuit with an oxygen supply. When night falls on Mercury, the planet cools down incredibly quickly. The temperature drops to three times as low as at the North Pole. So let's get out of here before you freeze completely stiff. The next planet is Venus. Oh, there's a nasty smell. It's the sulfur dioxide in the air. It would also smell like this near a volcano on Earth. You get on the scales and 122 pounds, almost as much as on Earth. No wonder Venus and Earth are called twin sisters. This planet has almost the same size as ours and only 20% lighter, so it has almost the same gravity. 
But you couldn't live here because Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system. And the atmospheric pressure on its surface is 92 times as high as what we have on Earth. You'd only feel the same pressure if you dive 3,000 feet underwater on our home planet. Without special equipment, you'd be crushed at such a depth. Your spacesuit is made of titanium to withstand this kind of pressure. Just like an atmospheric suit for deep sea diving. And it weighs about 830 pounds. It's like carrying the weight of a motorcycle. That's why you feel weaker here than you do on Earth. But moving on to our home planet, or more specifically to its satellite, the Moon. Several astronauts have been here before. You might have seen videos of how awkwardly they moved around, sometimes even falling. That's because gravity on the Moon is six times weaker than on Earth. Your solid 135 pounds of weight turns into 22. So now, you weigh like a plastic shopping cart. On the bright side, you can now lift six times that weight. You can flip a car or lift a pony. You can probably even lift the lunar rover that's still standing here left by the last moon mission. One of the astronauts, Alan Shepard, hit several golf balls here. And one ball weighs less than a half an ounce on the moon. Hey, maybe you can use all that power to clean up the stuff people left here. That's about 250 tons, including rovers, broken space probes, lunar module sections, golf balls, and the like. Nah, let's do the cleanup later. Now we're going to Mars. Hey, you're the first human on the surface of the red planet. And the first thing you do is weigh yourself, of course. Ah, 50 pounds, almost three times less than on Earth. It's even less than the weight of a capybara, a big rodent from South America. That's because Mars is 50% as light and 10 times as small as our home planet. And since gravity is weaker here, you become three times stronger. You can lift two of your friends. But this kind of gravity is actually a problem for people. We're planning to colonize Mars. But our muscles are used to the constant gravity of Earth. They won't work at their full capacity on the red planet. This will cause health problems for the astronauts, so they'll need to exercise all the time or tie weights on themselves to become heavier. They'll have to carry at least 10, 20-pound dumbbells to get close to their real weight and keep their muscles toned. Now, a quick trip to Jupiter. This is a gas giant. Hey, again with the gas. And it doesn't have a solid surface. All you see are dense clouds. So it's probably best to stay on the platform. Jupiter is 317 times as heavy as Earth, so the gravity here is much stronger. Your scales show 340 pounds. That's like the weight of a big wild boar on Earth. Now, you can barely stand on your feet in your spacesuit. You feel very weak. The maximum weight you can lift here is 60 pounds. That's as much as a husky dog weighs. Let's take a look at Jupiter's moon, Europa. You stand on the scales and see 18. Yup, gravity is so weak here that you weigh like a garden gnome. At the same time, you can easily lift 1,000 pounds. That's like a horse or a grand piano. With that kind of strength on Earth, you could flip a school bus or lift a small car over your head, if you wanted to. Moving on, Saturn, another gas giant. Hold on tight, Woohoo! winds here can reach 1,100 miles per hour. Such a gust of wind could carry you across the United States from one coast to another in just two hours. Hurry up and get on the scales. 144 pounds. It's a little more than you weigh on Earth. That's why you feel a little weaker, like after a good workout at the gym. Saturn's moon, Titan. You might want to stick around a bit longer because here you feel like a real weightlifter. You can lift seven grown-ups in your arms. Or a great white shark. Just be careful with those teeth. And your own weight here is about 17 pounds, like a domestic cat. Maybe a fat tabby. Uranus is the coldest planet in our solar system. It's 10 times as cold there as in a freezer. The scales show 120 pounds. You can lift a truck wheel here. The last planet in our solar system, Neptune. It's 17 times as heavy as Earth and 4 times its size. And the strongest winds ever recorded blow here. The number on the scales is 150 pounds. Yep, you've gained a little weight. But the same would happen if you took a dumbbell in your hands on Earth. Now, how about moving to more unique space objects? For example, a neutron star. This is one of the heaviest and densest objects in the universe. A neutron star has the weight of the sun, but it's so small that it would fit in Manhattan. But this space object has a solid surface, so you can land your spaceship here. The neutron star's weight and density makes gravity incredibly strong here. Your 135 pounds on Earth 
turn into 190 plus 11 zeros pounds here. You'd be flattened like a pancake on a neutron star. You wouldn't even be able to pick up a match here. A regular sewing needle would weigh 140,000 tons. That's like 2,000 Boeing 737s. Next in line is a black hole. Well, we don't even have a number to describe your weight here. Black holes are the densest and heaviest objects in the universe. They lie at the centers of galaxies and can weigh millions and billions of times more than the Sun. They're so heavy that they warp space-time. Once you're in a black hole's gravitational field, you can never get out of there. And the gravitational pull increases with every inch you get closer to the center of the black hole. If you were falling into a black hole and extended your arm forward, the force affecting your fingers would be much stronger than that pulling on your elbow. And your hand would stretch like spaghetti. Your weight is infinite here, and your strength is infinitely small. Don't even hope to lift a single atom or photon of light here. Yeah, that's enough. Let's go home. If you were floating in space, no one would be able to hear you whisper, talk, or even scream in horror at seeing a giant asteroid coming towards you. It's not only that you'd be far away from Earth, but sound needs space to travel through. Sounds are just vibrations of molecules and atoms in some medium, like water or air. Your body will pick up sound waves through the ear canal and to the eardrum. Vibrations we receive then transform into electrical signals so our brain can understand and recognize them. Frequencies of sounds humans can hear are between 20 to 20,000 hertz. Sound travels four times faster in water because molecules are closer together than in air. Naturally, it travels faster through steel than both water and air. The loudest natural sound on our planet is one made by an erupting volcano. Not 100% certain, but scientists believe the eruption of Krakatoa in 1983 was probably the loudest sound humankind ever had the chance to hear. It exploded with enormous force, destroyed its island, and released 20 million tons of sulfur into the atmosphere. People even heard it 3,000 miles away. It would be like someone producing a sound in New York and people hearing it all the way in Ireland. Sound can take many forms, but humans are most familiar with it in the form of pressure waves that move through the air. Sound goes more slowly through heavy gases and colder air. It travels faster through lighter gases, for example, helium. There's no water or air in space, so the sound doesn't have anything to travel through. Our atmosphere consists of 10 trillion trillion atoms, which is like dense soup creating a way for sound to travel. And there are only 10 atoms per cubic meter up in space. That means space is empty and silent. But it wasn't always like that. The universe is 10 to 20 billion years old. It appeared as a result of the Big Bang. It wasn't an explosion that started from just one single point, but rather space appearing everywhere in the universe at the same time. Back then, the whole universe was like a hot ball of plasma. It was much thicker than today, so the sound could pass through it. As the universe was forming, it produced shock waves, and they, in return, produced a cosmic rumble way deeper than things our ears can normally detect. These are the actual and the first sounds the universe ever produced, at the stage when it was still forming. Scientists decoded them and pitched them up to a version we can actually hear. As time went by, the universe was stretching. Today, it's a lot wider, emptier, and quieter. It's good for us, though. If sound traveled through space with ease, we would constantly hear loud explosions, crackles, moans, and other sounds space bodies make out there. The sun isn't silent either. Here's the sound of its vibrations created by its loops, waves, eruptions, and other activity. The sun creates trillions and trillions of watts of sound energy, something like pulsation, low heartbeat. It helps researchers discover what's going on inside of the sun and understand its layers. If it wasn't muted for us on Earth by a lack of air in space, it would be like hearing a jackhammer all the time. 
If you and your friend were taking a walk on the surface of the moon, you wouldn't be able to hear each other talk. No air, no sound. But that doesn't mean the moon itself doesn't produce any sound. When the first spacecraft landed on the moon, it caused crashes which later led to moonquakes. Scientists took a chance to measure vibrations going through the moon to figure out its internal structure. They realized they caused vibrations that lasted longer than they expected, and longer than any similar vibrations on Earth. It was like those moonquakes were producing the sound of a ringing bell. When we have earthquakes, moisture in the ground acts like a sponge. It absorbs the energy of the waves spreading around until it ends their effects, which is why water eventually stops the earthquake. The moon is dry, more like a solid rock. Moonquakes are less intense, but there's no water to stop them, so vibrations just go back and forth through the moon. The solid rock stops them at some point, which is when the ringing stops too. Let's see what happens with the sound on different planets. Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn are mostly made of helium and hydrogen. These gases are way lighter than the atmosphere on our planet, so your voice there would generally come out in a higher pitch. But each planet has its layers that make differences in sound. Neptune has its murky depths, Uranus its methane clouds, but they're both freezing, made of gas, and have ice particles in their atmosphere. Saturn, also a gas giant, boasts wild, raging storms. Saturn's biggest moon, Titan, is the only one known for having a real atmosphere. It's thicker than the one we have on Earth. It's very cold there, and it rains liquid methane. In 2005, researchers sent the Huygens spacecraft that managed to record incredible audio you might find familiar. The sound of winds, but billions of miles away from us, on Titan itself. If you were there, you might even hear the sound that reminds you of a waterfall. In reality, it's flowing liquid methane. Moving to Jupiter, it doesn't have a solid surface either. It's made of gas that becomes denser the deeper you go. At some point, it even turns into a liquid. The sound is different in each of those layers. Jupiter is actually pretty noisy and has bizarre sounds. It creates intense radio storms with powerful lightning bolts. While there, you'd hear their echoes of echoes, just going back and forth. Mars, its atmosphere is way thinner than Earth's, which means there are not many molecules for sound to travel. Winds can get pretty fast, like our hurricanes, but on Mars, they would feel like a gentle breeze. You wouldn't necessarily hear the storm, though. You'd maybe hear the dust as it gets picked up and banged against your spacesuit. In the thin atmosphere, your voice would be much quieter, and it wouldn't travel far. Someone could be standing next to you and screaming, and you'd probably hear nothing. Low-density air actually makes our voices sound higher-pitched, but the cold temperatures, like on Mars, slow down the sound so it would balance out again. Your voice there would sound a bit distant and blurry. And imagine listening to an instrument like a guitar or piano there, like some muffled melody from a dream. Sound on Venus is kind of the opposite of Mars. Venus has a dense atmosphere, much denser than ours, something between water and air. There, you'd hear sounds like when you're underwater. The environment is a bit different with 900 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 tons of atmospheric pressure. But let's say you have a magical spacesuit that protects you from getting crushed or scorched. While on Venus, you'd hear thunder. 40 years ago, a spacecraft successfully landed on its surface and managed to go almost an hour before it shut down. It picked up these amazing sounds of strong winds. If you started talking on Venus, your voice would first hit the lower pitch because of the dense atmosphere. But it would then sound higher because hot air increases the speed of sound. It would be kind of distorted and muffled together with the sounds of thunder around you. Mercury is a rocky body with no atmosphere, so standing on its surface and talking would be like trying to talk while floating in space. Useless. Those are almost vacuum conditions, which would make you think Mercury has no sounds at all. Still, you can hear them, though not in the air. The rocks. Put your ear against the ground. Maybe a Mercury quake is coming. The universe is a place connected by light. 
Light can go anywhere from any spot in space, but not the sound. So not only do we have a planet that supports life, but offers a wide palette of sounds. Even without us, it wouldn't be a quiet spot. A light breeze gently caressing treetops, earthquakes, volcanoes, deserts. The ocean with its waves on the surface and scary sounds deep below. Up there, it's a quiet mystery. But down here, it's true magic. You're on a plane heading to an important astronomy convention when you see a large figure outside your window that eclipses the whole sun. You spit out all of your coffee and everyone in the plane stares outside in shock. You then notice that it has rings like Saturn. You were supposed to fly to Japan, but you're forced to land in California. As soon as you land, you look up in the sky and see some more giant planet-like structures floating around in the sky. Everyone is taking pictures and trying to figure out what's going on. Suddenly, you notice a huge ball of fire crashing down near the airport. Everyone scrambles for safety, and luckily, it ends up in the middle of the runway with no one around. The bad news is, there's no more runway for planes to land. Everyone huddles together for safety, and more large objects appear in the sky. All communications have ceased or broken down, since these large objects have ruined all the satellites. Some scientists nearby mention that these objects are the planets of the solar system going within the same proximity as our moon. Mercury and Venus look like moons, but Saturn is occupying a lot of sky real estate. You tell those scientists that you're an astronomer. They invite you to join them on a trip to Antarctica to the observatory station in the South Pole. They need every mind to help solve this mystery. You get on a ship with the coordinates set to Antarctica. The waves are extremely rough for typical daylight and non-stormy weather. You finally make it to the shore of the continent after a few days and have to get in a snowmobile all the way to Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. Over here, you and a group of scientists will figure out what's going on. You weren't prepared for the freezing temperatures, even though it's July. You arrive at the station and see all your fellow scientists running around with paperwork and blurting out stuff about planets orbiting our atmosphere. You arrive at the conference room where the lead scientist explains what's going on. One by one, the planets are coming closer to us until they're aligned with the moon, but they still don't know why and how. Venus arrived first, and now Saturn is getting closer. The moon is around 240,000 miles away from Earth, and it affects the tides of the oceans and seas with its gravitational pull. Since water is less dense than land, we can see the tides change. So high tides occur when the Earth is pulled towards the moon. And since the other planets are coming closer to Earth, the gravitational pull is erratically changing. In a couple of hours, Saturn will be in the same distance as our moon. You head to the large telescope and observe the planets. Any plane or helicopter won't fly properly and won't have the proper radar technology to help it. You keep observing and notice Mars getting closer to Earth. You get news that tidal waves are rising very often now, and some island nations are even being washed away. Good thing they got evacuated beforehand. With Mars closing in, you notice Neptune also getting closer. You can feel the gravity on Earth fluctuate with every step you take. You report your findings to the lead scientist, and the only way for survival is to quickly build bunkers far away from oceans and seas that can host many people before the other planets close in. A team of engineers arrive and start building. Wave after wave of survivors come and settle into the bunkers, practically built overnight. With every hour, more planets are getting closer. Mars and Neptune have already settled in with Mercury, Venus, and Saturn. Pluto and Uranus are now visible to the unaided eye and are making their way towards Earth. The gravitational pull is getting completely out of hand. The snow in the Antarctic desert remains floating for several seconds whenever someone walks on it. You can jump a lot higher. It's now nighttime, but the sky isn't dark as usual. The planets are reflecting a lot more sunlight than our moon. It's barely visible now. With more observations, you notice comets and meteorites flying very close to our atmosphere. Some are even crashing down on Mars and Neptune. Everyone can see it from Earth. 
Other space debris also finds its way into Earth's atmosphere. But you notice something strange. The planets are now orbiting Saturn. You check your calculations and find out that the planet's positions are now aligned with Saturn's orbit. That's because it has the biggest mass among all the planets. Saturn's rings are made up of ice particles, some as large as a bus and others as tiny as pebbles. But they're all crashing and interfering with the other planets. No one can feel the orbit shift at first, but later you can start to feel it. With this happening, earthquakes and volcanoes are bound to happen. This is why everyone, including yourself, is packing up and ready to flee. Antarctica has dozens of volcanoes hidden beneath the frozen ice. Some are underground, while some are right on top. Saturn's gravitational pull is much stronger than Earth's gravitational pull on the moon. This will cause the inner core to react a lot more and kickstart those earthquakes and volcano eruptions. Everyone packs up super quick and heads to the choppers to fly to South Africa. These choppers were designed to have a direct course without the need for radars to guide them. You arrive in South Africa, which is mainly covered in water. The chopper takes you closer to the center, and then you travel to the Sahara Desert. The plain surface with nothing around it will be the best option for safety. But you look up in the sky and see another planet closing in. It's Jupiter, the biggest planet in our solar system. If Earth were the size of a grape, then Jupiter would be the size of a basketball. It's approaching quickly. Many of the other planets automatically make way for it, including Saturn. You're on the road heading to the Sahara, even though it'll take days to reach by car. The sky is dark during the day, since most planets are blocking the sun. You finally make it to the Sahara Desert with other scientists. And to your surprise, a whole city was erected in just a month when the planets started showing up. You settle in your dorm, but still have a lot of work to do. A couple of days later, Jupiter breaches the atmosphere and completely eclipses us. But Earth is now rotating around it. And it's much quicker than orbiting the Sun, since Jupiter is smaller. But since Saturn is also big, Earth keeps getting tossed from orbit to orbit, like two people playing a ball game with each other. So with that happening, people on Earth are experiencing different gravitational pulls from time to time. The tidal waves keep getting stronger, and volcanoes are erupting everywhere. Since the Earth's core is getting hotter, the temperature on Earth is also changing. And with a lack of sunlight most of the time, much of the plant life is having a hard time trying to keep up. Crops are harder to plant with natural sunlight, so people are turning to artificial lighting and greenhouses. Air and space travel are impossible. The International Space Station is completely ruined, along with the satellites orbiting space. That's why cell phones and the internet can't work. Gravity is even more dysfunctional than ever. Six months later, humanity has found some way of coping with the new normal, but things are constantly being updated. The number of hours in a day has changed, as well as days that compose a week. This used to be measured with the moon phases, a month used to be the moon achieving all phases from none to full moon, and so on. But Earth's moon has disappeared with the cluttered, disorganized planets. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your